I want to talk about something that is just critical in the understanding of whitetails. Um, and it's critical not only for if you have your own land or you have lease land that you want to improve, but if you're hunting public land and if you're hunting whitetails in general, you have to understand the afternoon food source movement. And that's the foundation of all deer movement anywhere. Even a rutting buck that seems like he's making random movements, they are highly calculated based on where other deer and especially does and fawns are relating to a food source on a daily basis. Deer feed five times in a 24 hour period. This is a point that I hammer home in my food plot book that I uh, published in 2014. The first two sections talk about food plot goals and food plot structure. There's five chapters in there. Even uh, the next section, which is critical concept of food, of food there's uh, actually five chapters in there. So 10 chapters on really the structure of food, how deer move, and how you can hunt and relate to that food. It doesn't matter if it's on private or public land. In fact, those first 10 chapters, only a couple that apply specifically to private land. The other eight chapters apply to anywhere a whitetail roams. And that's the concepts in my book. That's why the concepts in my first book, Whitetail Success by Design, that's how deer relate the entire movement, what they do on a daily basis. And if you understand what they do on a daily basis and what those five feedings are, and how important that third feeding is of the, of the day, then you can hunt whitetails anywhere. It really doesn't matter because it all boils back down to that food source and where they're feeding at every day. Our 25 acre parcel that we had this year. This is a buck that my 14 year old son, Sam shot, he shot with a crossbow. And I'm um, sorry any of you crossbow haters out there, but just the way it is. It was awesome sitting right next to him. 25 acre parcel. Um, we bought that in April, May, somewhere on there. We closed on that property around that time. Couldn't really devote a lot of time to it because um, in the first part of the year, I'm on client properties. I was on about 90 client properties last year in 14 different states. And uh, that goes from December to September and that's no different this year. Um, we're well booked out. That 25 acre parcel, the first thing we did in August when we can actually work on it, was in, we installed about an acre and a quarter to an acre and a half of food plots. We put in a water hole, three mock scrapes. And that was critical to the success of that parcel, really starting with food, because again, going back to that's the foundation of every parcel. And that 25 acre parcel we have, have for sale right now. I love doing this. I wanna do that to another parcel, fix it up. And it's an hour and a half from home. I wouldn't mind being about uh, 15 minutes from home or right out the back door. So that's ultimately the goal too, but amazing what you can do on a small parcel. The food is the foundation of all deer movement again. And I'm gonna tell you how that relates to big woods, to small parcels, and what you need to look for in the area that you're hunting. And again, I'm going back to deer feed five times in a 24 hour period, real quick. Feeding number one, I, I've numbered these. This is what I determined. John Azoga told me about 1999 that deer rhythmic pattern feeding, feeders are like babies. John Azoga is leading deer research biologist for the entire country. I think he has the most peer reviewed articles out of anybody over 100, around 100. So a true deer scientist, but he's the one that hammered this point home to me. Feeding number one and two, I, I refer to them as, take place in a deer's bedding area. You have to have that deer browse, woody browse, acorns, chestnuts, whatever it is, it's all woody browse. You don't want apples, you don't want food plots in that area in any way. You want woody browse, that's what deer feed on twice during the morning, late morning, early afternoon time. And the number three feeding is actually their number one feeding of the day that sets the foundation of movement and that is that hour before dark and then you have two feedings at night and you would like, I mean, ideally, especially in ag land, maybe areas where there's food plots, there's high pressure, there's ATV use, baiting, baiting, whatever it might be, you want the deer feeding on number four and five, you want those feeding on your neighbor's property, neighboring properties um, during the middle of the night. One of the biggest food sources I can, you know, really urge you to find on public land and it may even be that it's on your neighbor's property in a private land area. Maybe you're even making this on your own large private parcel. But this especially works well on public land is to look for clear cuts. And when you find clear cuts, you want to look at clear cuts that hold the age of browse that deer can actually feed on during the day. And what I mean by that is if the browse is shoulder high or above and uh, much, much more above shoulder high, then deer aren't gonna be able to reach that browse and it's lived its usefulness in, in life. And I'll even see this down in areas I've hunted um, on public land where um, it seems like good cover. You have pole timber, you still have a lot of stems per acre, maybe a thousand to 1500 stems per acre, uh, maybe even 2000. 
uh, but there's just no food in that area. And so you'll see old rubs, rubs it, that uh, were defined when the, when the trees were a little bit younger, they're scarred, and the deer just leave and they go to a younger area that's been clear cut and it actually offers food. What I see in northern areas is uh, clear cuts will often offer food up to eight to 10 years plus. And that's because those trees grow slower, even aspen regeneration, and there's still food available up to those times that um, deer can still reach it within that shoulder high height. When you go to southern areas, southern Ohio, southern Indiana, southern Illinois, Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, wherever it might be, then what you find in those areas is that the browse grows a lot faster because there's a lot faster growing season. There's also more multiflora rows and briars and garbage in there to where in a clear cut, it is quite likely that in some of those areas at year four, not only can we not move through that clear cut without swimming on top of the brush basically, um, deer can't move through it either. And so even a doe falling, they can't slip into there. It literally is too thick. And, and so once it gets to that year, whether it's three or four or five, um, in the cases of the northern areas with slower growth, maybe year eight, nine, 10, 11, then it's outlived its usefulness. And so in an area that practices routine and random and rotating clear cuts, those deer are gonna move like caribou even from one year to the next. So it's always good to focus on those young clear cuts, whether it's a little bit older uh, clear cuts that get their usefulness in the northern areas or a little bit younger. But clear cuts can define your hunting no different than hunting a cornfield surrounded by woods. And there's a lot of times in those areas there's some really remote or hard to get to clear cuts. I can think of some really, really hilly areas I've hunted in and, uh, and it presents a lot of difficulty and guess what? That eliminates a lot of hunters. So clear cuts on pu public land especially, they can be that food source that dictates that afternoon food source movement and something that even if you don't have a lot of land, if you don't own land, you don't lease land, you don't have the money to do so, you can't find private land, there's always some quality public land within an hour to two hours of just about everyone's house in the north half of the country for whitetails. Number two area, private land, ag land. When you have that private land, if I had private land and I couldn't plant food plots on it, then I'm gonna go hunt public land. Cause you can always find a quality uh, food source movement on public land. You just have to go deeper than everybody else. You have to recognize this movement that other folks and other hunters don't recognize. But on private land, it boils down to, you only have 50 to 80 acres to work with 100. I mean, how many out there have 200, 300 acres to work with on private land? But even if you have those numbers, you still have to have a quality food source movement. Or I'd rather go hunt some of the public land areas that have 50,000 acres, 100,000 acres, because I can put on a lot of boot time and I can find those food sources, those clear cuts, those movements, those benches and saddles and hilly areas those south facing exposure areas that might have more food. Doesn't mean that deer live on there and bed on that location, but they might have more food. But in those private land areas, if you have a small private land parcel, boy, you are severely limited if you have 40 acres and you do not offer a quality food source. And an ag field is not, I repeat, an ag field is not a quality food source. It doesn't define a daily movement. It's rotating, random. It can change throughout the season, let alone from year to year. One side of the parcel can be good when it's corn. The other side is beans and they're brown in September, October and they're harvested. Maybe the farmer picks the field earlier. Maybe they plow the field earlier. And so everything is always changing. You cannot have a defined movement. Not The, the beauty is with a small parcel is that you can look at and say, with my food plots, I'm gonna hold deer from September to January and I'm gonna have that definition of movement in that afternoon structure movement every single season. The deer get used to it. We've been shooting does the last couple days and it's almost unfair to the doe population because they're not used to being shoot, shot at. Um, they start eating those food plots in August and then it goes in September, October, November, December, and we're shooting at them. And it's the one time we spook them off those plots per year and they just keep coming back. And it's because they're not used to being spooked out of those areas. They do not want to leave that food source and the bedding areas that they relate to and the comfort for that all season long. And that's the beauty about a private land parcel is you can set up that structure movement. And if you don't set up that structure movement, you don't have those food plots, you might as well just go hunt public land because you can find that same structure movement on public land. It might be a green prior top down in Ohio or Indiana where those deer are feeding on that. It's mixed with some acorns of red and white, earlier dropping white, later dropping red. 
and then you have the green briar. So then you have a good food source there. Maybe it's adjacent to a clear cut. Now you got three food sources in one little tight area. You take out all the steep draws in between the big wooded areas that don't have anything and you can narrow it down even to an area that doesn't look that much different to areas that really hold a lot of food. And again, it all boils back to those white toes are gonna to hit that heavy, put the feed bag on for that last hour of daylight, which is their dinner time. And in an ag area, if you're planting food plots, you can win the neighborhood, especially when you're not overpressuring those food sources like everyone else is. And you have food sources that last from August through January and beyond which rarely anybody has either. They're looking at specific time periods, you know, beans early and late, if they're even there. Corn during November, if it even makes it there. But you're looking at food sources, especially a green base, maybe even some corn that lasts the entire season. And again, you can pull in every deer into that afternoon movement by the time it gets in November, December, as other food sources are being depleted and shortened throughout the area, then your property is even gonna be more attractive and it doesn't matter if it's a 30 acre parcel, a 20 acre parcel, or a 200 acre parcel. You can win the neighborhood when it, when it comes to attracting deer during the heart of the season by focusing on that high quality afternoon food source. And finally, let's not forget whether it's on your own land or it's out on public land that you don't forget about those marshes and waterways that offer a, a distinct diversity of habitat. And when you have diversity of habitat, you have food. Whether it's a marsh going down to cedars and then right over your dogwood thickets, add in a clear cut up in the hardwoods up above and briars, you can have a diversity that's not found in the open hardwoods or even the open cedar stands down in northern areas, red cedar down in the southwest southern areas you can have a level of diversity that you can find when you focus on water and of course not out in the water but um, areas that have water waterways rivers beaver uh, ponds you can find a lot of habitat food and diversity all that diversity equals food and something you can focus on no different than hunting those clear cuts the cool thing and this is these are some of the areas i hunt in the up of michigan where i'm hunting those diversity food source wet waterway movements and the cool thing about that, it's not like an 80 acre clear cut on the side of a hill or a ridge system in, in say Southern Ohio in one of the big forests, like the Wayne National Forest. Those waterway movements are thin. They feature a lot of edge. And when you have thin edge, high quality, diverse food source off offerings that represent that third feeding of the day right before dark, then you have a lot of funnels that you can hunt stick a stand on it and search for, and you can see those on an Onyx map, some type of mapping software, well in advance before you ever even put boots on the ground. And those are areas that you can search and find not only great deer movement, but that third feeding of the day. So those are three areas, whether you're focusing on clear cuts, big woods, clear cuts, public land, you're focusing on food plots in ag land. Again, ag fields are not a good food source. They're always changing. If someone sets up shop next to you with quality food sources and does not spook them out with quality food plots um, in ag area and you're relying on ag, then you're not going to see many deer during the day if they're doing it right. And uh, I teach people how to do that all the time. And these antlers and what we did this year, um, we hunted this land more. Um, and Diane's hunting now. Diane, Dante hunted a little bit more. And so we just multiplied our success that normally happens because we had more hunters this year. But... This is what we do. We focus on that third feeding of the day. And I think it's gonna result in a couple more does harvested tonight, at least one more doe. Um, because again, they just keep hitting those food plots because they're used to it. And that's the foundation of movement every single day. And whether you have a small property, whether you have a large private land parcel, or whether you're hunting public land, if you find this third feeding of the day, someone asked me today, you know, the area I hunt on public land is all clear cut. It's all hardwood regeneration. Well, I urge you to go find the edge. Find where it meets mature timber. Find where it meets a big elevation change. Find where it meets a marsh, maybe all combined into one area. And you're gonna find the deer on the side of that movement, on the side of that hardwood regeneration food area. Again, it all boils back down to food in that afternoon movement. That's the foundation of hunting anywhere and everywhere. A whitetail roams. And I wanna hear about it for this next fall hear about your past success because you find that food source and you're going to find whitetail success every season that you hunt whitetails.